Now, we are speaking just a few months after two very prominent female leaders, Jacinda mm -hmm. Ardern and Nicola Sturgeon, announced their resignation. Can I ask, what's your reaction to their departures? I know two is not a trend, but I, I was saddened by the news. Well, I think it was telling that both of them uh, said pretty much the same thing, which was, I've given everything I've got to this job. I've done as much as I can, and I need to step away because I don't have the kind of energy and focus that I need. I respect that. You know, in the case of Nicola, she's been uh, the leader of the you know, Scottish uh, party and government um, for a long time, uh, I think since 2014. Mm -hmm. And going through COVID was a real ordeal for any leader. But especially, I would argue, for leaders with empathy, leaders who cared about what happened to their people. And so both she and Jacinda gave so much of their compassion, their empathy, their feelings toward taking care of their people. It wasn't a job for them. It was a mission. That's exhausting. And it, it does drain you. And I think when Jacinda you know, basically said she just didn't have any any energy left in her tank. I mean, she was saying, look, I've given everything I could. And it's interesting, Maggie, because, um, you know, as some, I got into politics and into public service because I basically wanted to help people. I wanted to create better opportunities for people. So when you are really connected with, related to the people you are trying to serve, uh, you take it very personally. It's not just a job that, you know, you kind of go out, make a speech, go back, talk to some other people that are on your team and, and, and call it a day. You are deeply involved. And when you have that sense of connection, it does take a lot of energy. So I respect both of them. I hope that they both find, uh, you know, new ways of serving and that they are really fulfilled by what they do because they're terrific women. I know them both. They are. I noted that Jacinda has already been replaced by a male politician mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what's your sense globally right. of the pipeline of female leaders? I know it's not always a woman leaves and another right. woman steps in, but how can we strengthen that pipeline? Well, I think um, in both government and in business, um, because uh, Susan Wojcicki also left yes. uh, uh, YouTube after you know really building it into the success it became, uh, you're not always going to be followed by a woman just because a woman had been in the position, uh, which means that we still have work to do in both identifying and supporting younger women to get into that pipeline and to you know, basically pay their dues, demonstrate their um, capacities to get the job done, and be in a position that they can step into uh, senior leadership roles. It's a struggle. It never ends. It is still harder for women, particularly women with families, uh, to put in, you know, the kind of uh, constant attention and effort uh, undisturbed by other obligations. Uh, that I think um, is necessary in many of these uh, endeavors. And that argues for making it uh, institutionally easier for women to combine family and work, something we've talked about here at the conference. We lose a lot of talent, a lot of really smart, organized, effective uh, women who start off at the same level mm -hmm. as their male counterparts, as the you know, analytical work at Salesforce that Mark Benioff, uh, you know, ordered, uh, demonstrated. But then two things happen. One, men and companies and organizations' expectations of women's appropriate behavior holds women back. So mm -hmm. we know the stories. Um, he's ambitious, hooray, hooray. She's ambitious, a little off-putting, you know. And it's like, all the research that's been done where you send uh, two resumes that are exactly the same and you put Jane on the top of one and you know Joe on the top of the other, people react differently based on what they perceive to be uh, the gender. We got to keep fighting that. It is so unfair. And, and the companies and the organizations that have tried to eliminate that implicit bias, like 
orchestras. Orchestras did not have a great track record of picking women musicians, so they began doing blind auditions. In other words, you couldn't see that it was a woman playing the violin compared to a man. You only could hear the sound. And guess what? The number of women in orchestras uh, increased. So the implicit bias, dealing with that, and it's not a sign of malice, it's a sign of conditioning, mm -hmm. you know, what people expect from women. Then the other thing is, you know, as women begin to combine family responsibilities, particularly motherhood, with uh, their work responsibilities, there is, you know, there, there's just a sense that somehow they won't be as attentive. Mm. And, you know, Maggie, I've told this story before, but many years ago, uh, when I became a partner in my law firm, uh, I read a local column, and I can't remember what it was called exa exactly, but it was written by a man. It was advice for people in business. And I'll never forget a question that came to this uh, columnist was, uh, I just got promoted, I have my own office, I'm trying to figure out what do I decorate it with? And, and it was signed like TJ or something. So here was the answer. I can't tell from your initials if you're a man or a woman, but my advice differs. If you're a man and you have a family, put pictures of your family in your office because people will think you're a responsible person. If you're a woman, don't put pictures of your family in your office because people will think you can't stay focused on the job, you'll be distracted. I mean, come on, really? We've heard that from a lot of women in Wall Street, yeah. across sectors, really. Mm -hmm. 